So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lindsay Kaumehe-Eva, and I'm a social worker with the VA Homeless Program. I'm going to be the host of this uh, presentation. Um, so we have six different representatives from the HUD Honolulu field office um, presenting today. We have Ryan Okahara, who's the field office director, Mark A. Chandler, who's the community planning and development director, Rebecca C. Borja, who is the Senior Community Planning and Development Representative. Stephanie Kaimana An, who is the Senior Community Planning and Development Representative. Brian Johnson, who is also a Senior Community Planning and Development Representative. And Jesse Wu, who is the Director of Office of Public Housing. So the topic today is going to be HUD Homeless Resources. Um, this session will be recorded and it will be made available at a later date for viewing. Uh, in addition, this PowerPoint has a lot of uh, resources available and will also be uploaded to the website at a later date for you to download. So throughout this presentation, there will be a, free, a few different opportunities for question and answer. So there is a Q&A box um, on the bottom corner. And you can type in any of your questions that you may have. Um, so there will be a few different times throughout the presentation to ask as well as towards the end. Um, so from there, um, we will give it to Ryan. Okay, good morning. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, today, we're going to provide a brief rundown of the HUD resources that are available to assist with homelessness and then also to focus on homeless prevention. Uh, we're going to be taking a team approach. So there's a group of six of us. I'm going to briefly cover a few items, then I'll turn it over to our HUD community planning and development team with Mark, uh, Rebecca, Stephanie, and Brian. And then we're going to close out with Jesse Wu covering our public housing area. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with HUD, our mission is to create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality, quality affordable homes for all. Uh, we have programs that assist uh, the low income, the elderly, the disabled and the homeless, among others. Uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, our mission somewhat more uh, to focus on homeless prevention and to increase resourcing to fight homelessness. Uh, we have a few initiatives that are temporary in nature. I'm gonna cover that up front. And then we have a lot of programs that are longer term in nature. Although in many cases this year, they received additional funding as part of the uh, Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act or CARES Act. Uh, the additional funding in our case came out to about $50 million uh, for the state of Hawaii. Next slide, please. Okay, one of the short term initiatives that we have is uh, with our FHA eviction and foreclosure moratorium. Uh, there's a link that's on the screen. We can also, it, it'll be in the presentation that we'll include later. But the moratorium continues uh, to direct mortgage servicers to halt any new foreclosure actions and suspended all uh, current in process foreclosure actions uh, for FHA insured single family properties, uh, excluding legally vacant or abandoned properties. It also uh, demanded that we cease all evictions uh, from FHA insured single family properties. Effectively, uh, homeowners with FHA insured mortgages uh, should continue to make their mortgage payments during the foreclosure and eviction moratorium if they're able to do so. But if they're not, they can seek mortgage payment forbearance from their servicer. Uh, what the CARES Act and FHA requires the servicers to do is to offer borrowers with FHA insured mortgages delayed mortgage payments forbearance uh, when the borrower requests it uh, with the option to extend the forbearance for up to a year. Basically, it uh, means if you can't pay your mortgage, we'll defer that payment on FHA insured mortgages for up to a year uh, no penalties and fees are allowed as, as well. Uh, it also requires that the uh, mortgage servicers assess the borrowers to, to see if they qualify for what we call a special COVID-19 national emergency standalone uh, partial claim that puts all of the deferred payments towards the back of the loan. So it's a junior lien, which is only repaid at the uh, end when the borrower sells the home, refinances the mortgage, or the mortgage is somehow otherwise extinguished. So what I talked about is really federal government efforts that only protects uh, those with federally backed mortgages. 
Uh, although Governor Ige also recently extended Hawaii's eviction moratorium until the end of the year, and the CDC actually has a more broad uh, restriction on foreclosures and evictions uh, due to what they're considering a health and safety issue for uh, creating people that could end up being homeless. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the rest of the programs that we're going to list here, this is kind of our agenda, if you will, are programs that are uh, longer lasting to assist homeless and uh, come from three different program areas. Uh, the first is going to be from our Office of Native American Programs. Uh, the bulk of the presentation is going to be from our community planning and development area. And then the end is going to be again from public housing. All are longer term programs uh, to address HUD's mission, but in many cases were adjusted or modified to account for COVID-19 and to uh, prevent or address homelessness. Next slide, please. Okay, one example is going to be the Native Hawaiian Housing Block Grant. Next slide. Uh, here's the primary objective of Native Hawaiian Housing Block, Block Grant or NHHBG. It's a grant that HUD provides to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to carry out affordable housing activities, it could be rental or home ownership for eligible Native Hawaiian families on Native Hawaiian homelands. So you can see it can be applied to new construction, rehabilitation, acquisition, infrastructure, uh, support services, and then newly added was uh, emergency rental assistance, which I'll kind of discuss. So uh, DHHL is using their Native Hawaiian Housing Block Grant funds to provide emergency rental assistance to eligible Hawaiian homeland beneficiaries who are impacted by coronavirus pandemic. Uh, what they're doing are via this COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program, uh, which they launched in May in partnership with the Aloha United Way is to provide assistance for the payment of either security deposit and or uh, up to 12 months of rental assistance for those who've uh, experienced a loss of income or a job loss as a result of COVID-19. The program is really intended to prevent low-income Native Hawaiian families who are on the Hawaiian homelands wait list or already on the home, homelands or lessees, if you will, from slipping into homelessness. And if you need more information on the eligibility criteria uh, and to apply, you can just contact uh, Aloha United Way at 211. Next slide. Okay, uh, pending any questions you might have, I'm going to be turning it over at this point to Mark Chandler and his team to cover community planning and development programs, which again make up the bulk of our homeless uh, efforts and initiatives. Mark, over to you. Next slide. All right. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, yes, I'm Mark Chandler. I'm the community planning development director for the uh, office of CPD in Honolulu field office. Next slide, please. I'm going to be covering the Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, it's one of our bread and butter programs in CPD. It's, it's, it's one that uh, is, provides lots of different opportunities for uh, communities to invest in the homeless program, in infrastructure, and low and moderate income communities. So, so the primary purpose of this uh, program for the CDBG purposes is to benefit low and moderate income persons. We also have, uh, as part of the COVID response, uh, what we call CDBG CV, which all our grantees have received as well. But what do we do with the resources? We provide decent housing, suitable living environments, and expanded uh, economic opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. The way the money actually flows is that Congress gives HUD the resources, HUD gives the resources to our grantees. In the case of Hawaii, our grantees are the city and county of Honolulu, the counties of Hawaii, Kauai, and Maui uh, on the CDBG side of things. Uh, when, when the other individuals talk about our CPD programs, there are other resources that go directly to the state, and I'll let them discuss that. So once the grantee uh, gets the resources from HUD, they make it available to the various nonprofits in their community. Uh, we refer to them as subrecipients. Occasionally, there might be a contractor or a community-based development organization. Those organizations then carry the resources down to the client. So I anticipate that many of the folks on this session are probably in the box that we would define as subrecipient and or contractor or community-based development organization. 
There may be a few grantees online, but uh, ultimately, you guys are the ones that carry out the programs for us. You're the ones that actually uh, reach our end beneficiary. And I want to say thank you to you for carrying out those activities because absent of you, uh, a lot of work would not be done in servicing the, the homeless in Hawaii. So thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. So the types of activities uh, that you can do with CDBG money, you could acquire property to provide uh, maybe a homeless shelter. You could acquire property to provide housing. Um, you could buy land in order to build housing on it. Uh, we also can do a disposition where we can actually get rid of a piece of property that maybe is a blighted area. Generally, we don't see our grantees do much of that. Most areas that we see funding uh, applied to is what we call public facilities and improvements because most activities that homeless providers will come in with um, are generally something to do with a particular facility. So, uh, and as long as that facility is open to the general public and, and the low and moderate income persons, that's why we classify it as a uh, public facility. Then we've got the clearance activities we can do. The next activity that we see a lot of homeless providers participating in is our public service uh, activities. Generally, if you're looking for operating dollars to operate your program, it's going to fit under a public service function. But when you work with the grantee, in this case, say the city and county of Honolulu as an example, you would be working with the city to fund a public service activity in most cases. Under the CV money, we've seen a lot of assistance through interim assistance. Interim assistance is uh, where our grantees have elected to use some of their CDBG CV to provide temporary rental assistance. In the CDBG program, unlike uh, some of our other programs, we can only do temporary rental assistance generally up to three months. Uh, but that's generally where we'll a lot of times see interim assistance uh, being provided. Uh, uh, or it'll be under the public service, depending on what it is. Also, interim assistance may have to deal with um, a natural uh, disaster, for example. Uh, housing services, uh, if some of you guys on this call uh, or this session are housing counseling agencies, oftentimes you may fit under, under a housing uh, service activity. And then we also have, uh, clearly we can help in down payment assistance for home ownership. Uh, City and County Honolulu runs a great program uh, on uh, home ownership assistance. Uh, their program generally runs out of money very quickly. So if you have uh, uh, individuals that you're aware of that are low and moderate income, I suggest you contact City and County Honolulu and consider that program as potential assistance for home ownership, especially in Hawaii. Given our cost. And then micro enterprise, uh, those are basically uh, economic development activities to help small businesses. Next slide. Uh, rehabilitation, what oftentimes we see is housing rehab, uh, rental housing rehabilitation. Occasionally we'll see code enforcement. Uh, very rarely, but occasional, we'll see historic preservation with CDBG money, lead based paint. Uh, uh, is another uh, rehabilitation activity we can see. Uh, commercial rehab uh, is rare in our program, uh, but is an opportunity. Again, those of you that are on this session are probably primarily looking at ways to deal with housing the homeless. Uh, one of those activities we would anticipate you would potentially seek resources from a grantee would be for homeowner uh, rehabs and or rental rehabs. Next slide, please. So how do we achieve the requirements that Congress set on us? Uh, Congress set what we call national objectives. So there are three methods by which we can meet national objectives. The primary method is uh, those methods that you see circled in green uh, on the slide presentation, which is assisting low and moderate income persons. We can either assist them by an area benefit, or we can assist them on a limited clientele bit uh, benefit. Generally, most of our homeless individuals qualify through a limited clientele. And other activities and national objectives or that can be achieved by low and moderate stance would be in the housing and or job 
uh, creation, uh, job opportunities. Uh, there are also opportunities rarely used on this, what we call slum and blight. Uh, generally, a grantee has to decline an area in order to be qualified as slum and blight. We don't have any slum and blighted areas designated in any of our Hawaii jurisdictions. Um, but if a grantee should do that, then there would be opportunities for that. And the final area uh, that Congress has given us an opportunity to use is urgent need. Uh, we are seeing under under the COVID response under CDBGCV occasionally some uses of the urgent need, which means that you can actually assist some uh, over and above the low mod status. Again, low mod status is 80% of area median income or less. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of use of that because it's uh, very easy right now to meet more of the low mod status, which is the primary area of uh, our national objective. Next slide, please. Any questions on the CDBG program? I know it's a quick overview. We, uh, because there's so many pieces that we want to present, uh, we wanted to uh, make it quick, but if you have specific questions, please ask now. I don't see any in the question box now, but people can continuously put them in for the end. Okay. Uh, I'm passing it back to you, Liz. So um, this is Rebecca Borja. I'm a senior CPD representative at the HUD Honolulu field office. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the home program and about how the home program can be used to address homelessness um, here in Hawaii. So next slide, please. So the goal of the home program is to provide decent, safe, sanitary, affordable housing for low-income people. Next slide. Um, so the way that the home program is um, used to carry out activities is usually primarily through subrecipients, which are um, public agencies, nonprofit organizations that manage programs that are home funded. For example, a home funded tenant based rental assistance program or developer that's carrying that can be a nonprofit organization or for profit organization that's using home funds to create affordable housing. So the subrecipient or developer that has a home project in mind will, use, will apply um, to use the home funds through the city and county of Honolulu, Hawaii County, Kauai County, or Maui County. In the case of the city, the city is a direct home grantee, so the city will then submit its action plan to HUD to access those home funds. The counties are not direct um, grantees with, with HUD for the home program, so they will then submit their plan to the state of Hawaii, and the state of Hawaii will submit an action plan to HUD to access those home funds. So the most recent, the current allocation of home funds that is out there in your community right now is fiscal year 2020, the HUD fiscal year 2020 money. So it usually takes about a year um, for, for the monies to go from HUD out to um, the cities and the, and the state. And that's why it, even though it's technically their fiscal year 2021, it's HUD 2020 money. Um, that always confuses our grantees. Um, we do that on purpose, no, I'm just kidding. So, um, so the, the way the amount of home monies that's been allocated to um, Hawaii for fiscal year 2020, um, Honolulu received about $3.9 million in home funds and the state of Hawaii received $3 million. Um, next slide, please. So the home program is really four housing programs in one, and that's because you can use home to carry out four different types of projects. For example, homeowner rehabilitation, uh, home buyer uh, projects, rental housing development and tenant based rental assistance. So today, because this is the homeless awareness conference, I'm going to be focusing on rental housing development and tenant based rental assistance because of those are the primary types of activities uh, that where home funds are used to assist um, the homeless. Next slide, please. So rental housing development. So home monies can be used in rental housing development to acquire. So it can be used to acquire um, vacant land. It can be used to acquire an existing uh, rental housing project. Um, it can be used to build new um, affordable rental housing or rehab existing housing. And the, ultimately when the rental housing is either acquired, constructed or rehabbed, what you end up with is affordable rental housing. Well, how can the homeless or at-risk homeless or special needs groups such as um, homeless persons with disabilities benefit from rental housing development that's home funded? Well, the organization that operates it can operate it as transitional housing for the homeless or permanent rental housing for the homeless. The one thing to remember about the home program is the home program is primarily concerned about the income eligibility of the beneficiary. So what does that mean? 
So this little, um, up in the slide, you see this little house and it, it has 10 units in it. And this is a, an example of the income limits requirements. So in the home program, all households that are uh, assisted and live in um, home rental housing units have to be at or below 80% area median income. Um, and don't worry about the, the, that 80%, 60%, or 50% that I'm going to talk about. Just know that HUD has income limit tables that uh, break out by, by household size what that income, what that 80% income limit looks like. Um, so in if you have a, a, a 10 unit affordable rental housing development that's assisted with home monies and the entire project is 100% home funded, what you'll, what you'll, what that means is that all of the units, so in this case, 10 units will have to be occupied by people at, at or below 80% um, area median income. But the home, home program also has rules that we call the home project and a home program rule. And what that means is that 90% of the, of the units, of the home units, or in this case, nine units in a 10 um, unit project, have to be occupied by people at or below 60% of the area median income and two units or 20% have to be occupied by people at or below 50% of the area income. Um, next slide, please. So when the home program um, for rental housing development is combined with the, the continuum of care program, what does that look like? Well, the goal is to develop, so in this case, because home is developing the affordable rental, develop service enriched housing with rents because the home subsidy is there are significantly below the market levels and um, provide permanent rental housing to people after their more immediate needs of homelessness are addressed through emergency or transitional housing. So the home develops the transitional housing or the permanent um, rental housing and the COC program, um, if the project is specifically developed for homeless, you know, a COC program can, can use program funds to operate, so for operating costs, to cover the, the cost of services to residents or to provide uh, rapid rehousing short or medium term tenant based rental assistance or project based rental assistance in a home funded housing project. So those are the ways that home and COC can, can be combined when you're doing rental housing development. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So tenant based rental assistance is another uh, type of uh, ooh, one more back. Sorry. So tenant-based rental assistance is another type of uh, project that you can fund with home money. Um, and when we talk about tenant-based rental assistance under the home program, we, it can be a general community-wide TBRA program. It can be a TBRA program that's combined with self-sufficiency. It can be TBRA targeted for special populations, for the homeless, at-risk, uh, special needs groups like homeless persons with disabilities. Um, not only can you use um, when you do a home TBRA program, you can use it to fund the rental assistance part, but you can use it to provide security deposits or utility deposits. The, the, goal, the idea here is that every tenant that receives home tenant-based rental assistance has to be at or below 80% of the area median income, and 90% of all households that receive TBRA have to be at or below 60% of the area median income. Next slide, please. So when a home TBRA program is combined with continuum of care, how does that work? Um, well, when somebody is transitioning, for example, from an emergency sh um, shelter or transitional housing program in, I'm sorry about that, into permanent house, affordable housing, and they're using home TBRA uh, to provide the rental assistance so they can afford the housing, and they've graduated from a transitional housing program, for example, that it was COC funded, they can continue to receive supportive services from that COC funded program that they graduated from for up to six months. So the first six months that they're in home TDRA, they can still be receiving support services. The idea is that the first six might, months might be a little rough for them and the, and the COC program is there with supportive services to help them um, maintain stability um, in that permanent housing. Um, so next slide, please. So unlike CDBG and emergency solutions grant, where HUD actually provided additional dollars in allocation money to specifically address COVID, there is no extra money in the whole program to address COVID. So what HUD did do was announce some waivers and suspensions of home requirements um, in order uh, to be able to address uh, COVID. The only requirement is that if the city and county of Honolulu or the, 
or the state of Hawaii wanted to make use of those suspensions or waivers, they had to notify HUD in, in writing um, by email of their intent to use the waiver and specifically what, what those waivers are. Um, so the next few slides are gonna go over some of the examples of the waivers that are available in the home program. Um, they can get a little weighty, so I'm gonna try and go through them as quickly as possible. Next slide. Okay, so examples. So um, for home tenant-based rental assistance programs, right? The cost of administering the rental assistance has to be covered under with home admin dollars. Well, home administrative dollars are normally capped at 10%, but with uh, the, um, the waivers and suspension, HUD is waiving the 10% um, um, admin cost cap and increasing it to 25% of, of, of the city or the state's home allocation for 2019 or 2020. Um, another way they wanna maximize the flexibility of funding for COVID response is that normally the home program requires that, that uh, the state and the city set aside at least 15% uh, of their, the funds they receive for the home program each year to carry out a CHOTO development type project. Uh, the point of this waiver is you don't have to worry about what CHOTO is, but the idea is that they don't have to do that anymore. So if the city or the state have home funds that are set aside for, to carry out a CHOTO activity that's from their 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 home allocations, they, they, now they have an opportunity to reprogram those funds to carry out another activity to address COVID. And that activity could be affordable rental housing. It could be, it could be tenant-based rental assistance for the homeless to address COVID. Next slide, please. So uh, these, these, uh, these waivers right in, on this slide are primarily of interest to a, a organization that's a, a, a grant a home grantee because we're, we reduce the match requirement um, from 25 percent to zero um, for any home funds are expended all the way up until September 30, 2021, um, to address COVID. Um, if the state or the city decides that they want to reprogram some monies to address COVID and particularly to address COVID for the homeless, that public comment period is reduced from 30 to five days. So uh, I guess the important thing for you is that it. So a shorter period of time uh, to turn around and carry out a home funded pro project. Um, next slide, please. So to facilitate social distancing, to protect staff and home tenants from COVID, there are certain requirements that we're waiving temporarily. So individuals or families that lost em employment or income because of the COVID pandemic and they're applying to either a stay at a home assisted rental housing unit or to receive home funded tenant based rental assistance can through December 31st of this year self certify their income. So normally we would require supporting documentation. Now they can self certify. The only thing is that if that is done, then um, within 90 days after the end of the waiver period, so on or before March 31st, um, those um, the organizations that use the waiver will have to conduct an on site rent and income review. Um, We've also extended the time frame for communities to consult uh, for um, grantees to conduct on site inspection of um, home assisted units and income and rent reviews um, that are required before December 31st. Now they have until April 30th, 2021 to conduct those physical inspections of those housing units. Next slide, please. Um, also, to facilitate social distancing and protect home, home staff and home tenants. We're extending the time frame to conduct annual quality standards inspections of units or units that are occupied by recipients receiving home TBRA um, through December 31st of this year, um, with the caveat that the, the inspections will have to be conducted within 120 days of the end of the waiver period or on or about April 30th, 2021. Next slide, please. So the next few slides, they deal with if facilitating emergency tenant based rental assistance. So if a community um, doesn't have emergency, um, doesn't have a home current, current home TBRA program, then all of these uh, things will apply. We, you have TBRA programs here in Hawaii through the city and county of Honolulu and the state of Hawaii. So these slides, uh, I don't think really uh, apply to you. But I just wanted to put this information in here so you're aware about facilitating emergency TBRA. Um, next slide. 
This is more information about emergency TBRA. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Keep going, next slide. So um, all this information will be provided to you as a, as a handout. I'm told that it will be posted um, somewhere and you'll, you'll receive instructions on where you can get a copy of these slides. So all the information I skipped over, you'll be able to read on your own. I wanted to show you an example of home funds that were used to address homelessness um, right here in Hawaii. So the Sea Winds project on the Waianae side was developed by Housing Solution, and it includes 20 units that are studio that are short-term transitional housing for the homeless, and 30 two-bedroom um, townhomes that are permanent affordable rental housing targeting the homeless families. The whole project was uh, cost about $14.8 million, and home contributed about $6.3 $6 million to this. So the, um, so the point of this is that, um, you know, if you find that there's a need for affordable rental housing, like the, uh, the supply of affordable rental housing is not sufficient to address homelessness, then there is an opportunity to partner with your state and with your city and with your counties to develop, develop affordable rental housing targeted to the homeless um, and to do that with home funds. Does anybody have any questions? The next slide will be questions. I don't see any of this kind. So just keep moving. Okay, so I just want to reiterate what Mark said. I want to thank you all for what you do, um, so directly serving the homeless. You know, we are steps away from it. We we are able to contribute funding and provide technical assistance and training, um, but in the end, the money isn't worth anything if the people that are implementing the prog programs don't do a great job. So thank you for the great job that you do. Um, your turn. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, my name is Stephanie Kaimana on. I'm a CPD representative with the HUD Honolulu field office, and I'll be going over the National Housing Trust Fund or HTF. Next slide, please. Hey, Lindsay, I'm having a little trouble with the slides on my side. I can't see the entire slide. I'm not sure if there's a lag. There we go. I can see it right now. Okay, um, can you go back to the first one? Thank you. So the HCF program is a newer program in our um, CPD um, programs uh, compared to the home and CDBG. So for HCF, um, the first allocation, it's a formula grant actually um, was issued in 2016. Um, it was enacted as part of the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. So the first allocation went out in 2016 to our uh, state government agencies, and it's a dedicated fund intended to provide revenue to build, rehabilitate, and preserve housing for people with the lowest incomes. So it actually comes from revenues from um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. So it doesn't take away from the resources and allocations being um, budgeted for our other HUD programs. So um, the focus is to increase the supply of affordable rental housing for extremely low income households. So that um, is income of less than the federal poverty, poverty guideline or less than 30% of the area median income. And also very low income households, which is um, income of 50% of the AMI or less, including um, persons experiencing homelessness. And the HDF funds can also be used to increase home ownership for this population. Okay, next slide, please. So the HDF statute requires that at least 75% of the funds be used for rental housing to um, benefit extremely low income households. And the remaining 25% for rental housing um, for those who are 50% of the AMI or below. Um, for Home ownership activities, it's also for households with income of 50% or less of the area median income. However, when um, our annual allocation for HTF is less than a billion, then um, both rental and home owner units need to be occupied by extremely low income households. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So, 
at least 90% of the funds need to be used for the production, rehabilitation, preservation, or operation of rental housing, and up to 10% may be used for home ownership activities for first time home buyers. And um, it includes um, producing, rehabilitating, and preserving owner occupied households. Can also be used for down payment, closing costs, and um, interest rate buy down assistance. And the state um, government agency who's running the program can allocate to 10% for their own program administration and planning costs. Okay, next slide. So, like many of our funds, um, HDF assisted units can be in a project that also contains non HDF assisted units. So, our HDF funds are often combined with um, the home program funds that Rebecca just mentioned to develop affordable housing. And um, it can also be used for with the continuum of care program, which um, many nonprofit agencies use. Um, for example, um, COC can fund project based rental assistance. So, um, if you were to um, partner with a affordable housing developer agency who wants to provide dedicated project based COC units, that's also an option with HTF and. Um, HTF can also be used to buy or rehabilitate manufactured homes or to purchase the land on which a manufacturer home sits. Um, property can also be bought or demolished, but only if it's tied to a specific affordable housing project. And the HTF assistance can be in the form of a grant, a loan, deferred payment loan, or equity investment. Next slide, please. So as far as the um, HTF rents, um, it's a fixed amount to the greater of 30% of the area median income or 30% of the federal poverty guideline. And when HTF funds are used, um, the rental or homeowner units must be affordable for at least 30 years. And states are also allowed to establish longer affordability periods. So this is to ensure that um, our funds are used for a long duration period to intended um, population. Okay. Um, next slide. So HTF in Hawaii is um, managed by the state of Hawaii, specifically HHFDC, Hawaii Housing Finance and Development Corporation, and they have sub grantees, which I'll go over in the next slide. Um, the state has specifically Oh, I'm still finishing up the next slide. I'm sorry about that. So the state um, decided to specifically focus the HTF funds on rental housing only. Um, so since 2016, HHFDC has received an annual allocation from HUD of $3 million for HTF. And the state submits an annual um, allocation plan to us, which um, informs of what their priorities are for the HTF funds. And um, it also indicates like how they're, what type of criteria they're using for um, the funds and what are their rehabilitation standards and so forth. Okay, next slide, please. So the state has um, decided to use sub grantees. So that's units of local government. So the state issues um, the HDF funds to the city through the Department of Community Services. And for the County of Hawaii, it's, um, Office of Housing and Community Development. Kauai is Hawaii Housing Authority and Maui is Department of Housing and Human Concerns. So according to their allocation plan, which they submit, they do it on a rotational basis to allocate the funds to each county. And um, if interested, you can go to the link to see um, the state's annual allocation plans to see what um, their priorities are for the funds. And there's also opportunities through during the year for um, people in the community to give their input on what they think the fund should be used for. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to share a few projects in which HTF funds for use, um, HTF funds um, are being used to um, develop affordable rental housing. So one is Honey Hale in um, the city and county of Honolulu. So this is actually a nonprofit that use HTF funds, mental health kokua, 
used it to acquire a nine bedroom single family dwelling unit in Honolulu. And five of the nine units um, will be used to um, provide um, housing for extremely low income, single unrelated homeless adults with serial, serious mental illness, excuse me. So yeah, this is a great example of a nonprofit um, using the HTF funds. And um, another project is Kaloko Heights Affordable Housing Project on the County of Hawaii. So this is for the construction of um, two and three bedroom affordable rental housing units in Kailua Kona. And six of these units will be HTF assisted to serve households with incomes of 30% or below the area min income. And 5% of the units will be set aside for eligible families that are experiencing homelessness at risk of becoming homeless or transitioning out of an emergency shelter or transi transitional housing program. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and a few more projects. Um, the next one is on the County of Kauai, Kauai Workforce Housing Development. So this is a new construction of a 134 unit rental project. And, um, 11 of these units will be HTF supported. And um, Kaiaulu o Alalea on the county of Maui is um, a project in Kihei. So this will be a 72 unit um, project of which seven of these units will be HTF assisted serving families with extremely low incomes of 30% or below the early median income. And finally, Hale Makana o Maili in the city and county of Honolulu is a um, new construction of a 52 unit rental housing project in Wainai in which five of the units will be HTF assisted. Okay, so I just wanted to share a few um, ways that the HTF funds are being used in Hawaii to provide um, affordable um, housing and how um, some of them have been um, used to assist persons experiencing homelessness. Okay, next slide please. Are there any questions? So someone asked if the program would apply to persons who are not very low income, specifically for persons that are unable to meet down payment for purchasing a property. Okay. Um, so in the case in Hawaii, um, the state has focused the HTF funds on rental housing. So it um, sounds like this question is specifically for home ownership activities. So in the case of HTF, um, it wouldn't apply. Did I um, understand the question correctly? I think so. We can have him ask again. Yeah, he says, thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Are there any other questions? Okay, thanks so much for all the work that you do, um, particularly the nonprofits that um, work on our funds. I know it's um, challenging at times, but we really appreciate your work. And please contact us anytime if you have any questions um, that you need us to assist you with. Thank you. Okay, my name is um, Brian Johnson. I'm a senior CPD rep here at the Honolulu Field Office. Um, I'll be going over what we call our HUD homeless programs specifically. Emergency Solutions Grant, ESG, Continuum of Care, the COC program, and APWA, Housing Opportunity for Persons with AIDS. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. So right here, I have the allocations that were for 2020. This is for the state of Hawaii. And you can see the regular ESG is 454,000. Then the ESG CV1 and CV2. CV1 is 1.5 million. CV2 is 8.4 million. And then the regular HAPA formula is 268,000. And then on the CARES Act, the HAPA formula CV came out to 39,000. Next slide. 
and here's the allocations for Honolulu, the city and county of Honolulu. You have regular ESG is 704,000. You have CV1 and CVT2 through the CARES Act ESG. That's 2.4 million for CV1 and CV2 is a huge amount, 22.3 million. HAPWA regular formula is 653,000 and HAPWA CV is 95,000. Next slide. So I'll be going through the activities for a regular ESG program. Um, you can do street outreach component. Funds may be used for cost of providing essential services necessary to reach out to unsheltered homeless people and connect them to the emergency shelters and housing and services. Um, the emergency shelter component is used for costs of providing essential services to homeless families and individuals in the emergency shelters and renovating buildings to be used as emergency shelter for homeless families and individuals and operating those emergency shelters. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, sorry, back. Yes, homeless prevention component. ESG funds may be used to provide housing relocation and stabilization services. It's even short or medium term rental assistance necessary to provide an individual or family from moving into an emergency shelter or another place described in paragraph one of the homeless definition. And you can look in the regulations of that definition of at risk homelessness. The rapid rehousing component is ESG funds may be used to provide housing relocation and stabilization services and short or medium term rental assistance necessary to help homeless individuals or families move as quickly as possible into permanent housing or achieve stability in that housing. Next slide. And going into um, housing relocation and stabilization services, this is where the ESG funds may be used to pay housing owners, utility companies, and other third parties for the following costs. That's rental assistance and rental arrears. The financial assistance is the rental application fees, the security and utility deposits, utility payments, last month's rent, and moving costs. And then the services, the housing search and placement, housing stability, case management, landlord, tenant mediation, and tenant legal services and credit repair. Next slide. And for the rental assistance, the short term and the medium term, um, it's up to 24 months of rental assistance during any three year period. This assistance may be short term or medium term and payment of rental arrears or any combination of this assistance. Short term is for up to three months of rent. The medium term rental assistance is for more than three months, but not more than 24 months of rent. And payment of rental arrears consists of a one-time payment for up to six months of rent in arrears, including any late fees on those arrears. And rental assistance may be tenant-based or project-based. Next slide. The HMIS is a component of the grant that may be used to pay for the ESG fund. I mean, maybe for the paying of the HMIS for the continuum of care of that area. And so this is ESG. ESG does allow for this. And it's the purchasing or leasing of computer hardware, purchasing of the software licenses, purchasing or leasing equipment, including telephone line, fax lines, uh, furniture, obtaining technical support, and leasing office space. Next slide. And admin is the recipient may use up to 7.5% 7 7 of its grant for the payment of admin costs related to planning and execution of the ESG activities. Next slide. And here's the ESG CV, which is the CARES Act. Next slide. Um, so far, 
can you go back one slide? Okay, yeah, so basically everything that's eligible under 24 CFR 576 for ESG applies, except that there is no cap on emergency shelter and street outreach. Remember, this is for the CARES Act CV money. ESG CV funds can reimburse eligible costs incurred by a recipient or a subrecipient on or after January 21st, 2020 to prevent, prepare for, respond to coronavirus. Local documentation of beginning of costs must be maintained in the grantee records. And the CV funds may be used for the following additional activities. Provide temporary emergency shelters for individuals and families experience homelessness in order to prevent, prepare for and respond to coronavirus, to conduct or provide training on infectious disease prevention and mitigation for staff working directly to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus, and the use of funding will not be considered admin costs for the purposes of the 10% cap. Next slide. To provide hazard pay for staff working directly to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus, Install and maintain hand washing stations and bathrooms in outdoor locations for people who experiencing unsheltered homelessness and to add extra stations at shelters. To create reasonable and necessary landlord incentives to obtain housing for individuals and families at risk or experiencing homelessness, not to exceed 3 months of monthly rent. And also to pay reasonable costs to provide incentives to volunteers who have been and are currently helping to provide necessary street outreach, emergency shelter, essential services, and housing relocation and stabilization services during the coronavirus outbreak. Next slide. And to provide support to emergency shelters to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus from the date of the recipient and subrecipient began preventing and preparing for and responding to coronavirus up to 12 months from the date of the recipient's ESG CV grant agreement with signed by HUD. Also, hotel motel costs ESG CV funds may be used for the following hotel motel costs for individuals and families experiencing homelessness, receiving rapid rehousing assistance under the COC, or ESG programs receiving homelessness prevention under the ESG program or residing in permanent supportive housing. This just says the recipient may pay for a hotel motel from directly or through the hotel and motel vouchers. Next slide. This is the COC program. Next slide. I'll quickly go through components, which many of you have already used. The permanent housing, there's transitional housing, the supportive services only, Homeless Management Information System, which is HMIS, and then Homelessness Prevention. Next slide. And here are the eligible costs under the COC program. Acquisition, rehab, new construction, leasing costs, operating costs, HMIS costs, and project admin. The COC program, it's been a while since anybody did any kind of acquisition, rehab, or new construction. It's eligible. Next slide. And I'll quickly go through housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. Next slide. It's the formula program is eligible under the city and the state. Um, uh, competitive eligible applicants include states, local governments, nonprofits. Awards are based on competitive applications. Next slide. And basically, the components are may be used for a wide range of housing, social services, program planning, and development costs. Costs include, but not limited to, acquisition, rehab, or new construction of housing units, costs for facility operations, rental assistance, and short term payments to prevent homelessness. And an essential component in providing housing assistance for those targeted with special needs population is the coordination and delivery of supportive services. Next slide. And next presenter.
Hi, Jesse Wu here, Director of Public Housing. Uh, go ahead and um, let's skip to the next slide. Uh, this is an overview of the different public housing uh, agencies that our office works with. Basically, it's each county, uh, the different housing departments that early, uh, the folks earlier mentioned, um, along with HPHA, the Hawaii Public Housing Authority, the statewide agency. Um, I won't get into all the details here and data, but why don't we just go ahead and skip um, two slides into my last slide and talk about some homeless initiatives. So it's fairly uh, infrequent that our office uh, gets new funding and the new funding that's available these days uh, are targeted a couple of specific population. One of them is are those um, kids uh, exiting the foster youth um, uh, program and it's a partnership between um, the child welfare services along with our housing authorities. And there are two existing partnerships that happen right now that are in place one with Hawaii Public Housing Authority serving um, foster youth on Oahu, and then Hawaii County is a new agreement that uh, just happened last month. In both those circumstances, if there are kids uh, finishing um, and matriculating out of foster youth, uh, HUD will have, um, can allocate vouchers to help uh, those folks so that they don't go homeless as they leave the program. The other program that I'll mention, and this has been a while, I've been around for some time, it's uh, the BASH program, the Veteran Supportive Affairs Supportive Housing Program. It's a partnership with the VA um, where individuals who have, who meet the requirements in terms of their military service and background, um, work with the VA and get referred to our housing authorities, again, to get vouchers. Um, this program, um, all counties are participating. So if there are you know, folks in any area statewide, uh, that assistance is available. Next slide. I think that's it. If there's any questions, I'll feel free to take questions. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and maybe pass it on uh, for closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, I think this is maybe for Brian. Um, they said that you presented amounts for Oahu, but what about us on the outer islands? Okay. The, the amounts I did give for the state of Hawaii, which really is those amounts get divided up into the different outer island counties like um, Maui, um, Kauai, and the Big Island. Okay, thank you. And so then ba uh, so sorry, basically, sorry. yes, the um, ESG is. Um, through the state of Hawaii, and that's for the, not Honolulu, but for the other county islands, okay? Okay, and then someone wants to know, how do we access the application fees assistance? What agency or point of contact uh, to access these services? So for, what? Uh, for, for CPD programs, generally it's going to be through the county governments and or the state of Hawaii. So uh, for CDBG home, well, we'll start with CDBG. CDBG is going to be through city and county Honolulu, Hawaii County, Maui County, and Kauai County housing agencies. For um, the ESG program, it's run through the city and county Honolulu and the state of Hawaii. They allocate monies to various nonprofits within your communities. Uh, so if you want specific uh, application processes, you would need to go to one of those two counties for the ESG. Papua is the same as ESG. Uh, housing Trust Fund is coordinated through the state of Hawaii, HHFBC. They allocate resources to the counties on a rotating basis in most cases. And uh, you should contact HHFBC to determine the cycle for which county is going to get the money in a particular year. Um, I think I'm missing a resource. Uh, the continuum of care money is competitive. You can access that directly through our annual competition. You do need to work with your local continuum of care. So for the neighbor islands, Hawaii, Kauai, and Maui, you work through what's called bridging the gap. And uh, for uh, Honolulu, you work through partners in care. And for public housing, I'll let Jesse Wu give you that information. 
Uh, yeah, you would reach out directly to each of the public housing agencies at the counties or at the state. Thank you, Mark and Jesse. Um, so we just want to thank all the panelists for presenting today. There was a lot of great information. Um, again, uh, this presentation will be posted at a future date, uh, the recording as well as the slides on the website. Um, you can also uh, go to the conference webpage after this to find links to other panels and closing plenaries. I pasted it, the website into the chat box so you can click on that. Um, and I thank you all for participating. Everybody have a great day.